Select of the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment, or CAPE, and welcome to part one of CAPE BC's three-part series on environmental justice, co-hosted with CFMS Heart. I want to acknowledge that the many communities we gather from today are situated on the unceded traditional and treaty territories of hundreds of Indigenous nations across this country. I live and work on the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations, otherwise known as Vancouver, and am grateful for the peoples who have stewarded and protected these lands and waters since time immemorial and who continue to do so today. And as we begin, as some people have already been doing, I'd welcome you to enter into the chat who you are and where you're joining us from today. So in terms of background on our organizations, I'm just going to um, share some slides here. So the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment um, is a group of primarily physicians and health professionals whose mission is to better human health by protecting the planet. And we do this by engaging with government and media and doing research, running campaigns and empowering health professionals to be advocates for healthier environments. And that's part of what this webinar series is all about. Celia, did you wanna talk about what CFMR, CFMS Heart does? Yes, of course. Thank you, Melissa. Um, so hi, everybody. Thank you all for joining us. My name is Celia. I'm a third year medical student at the University of Calgary. Alongside the amazing Owen Liu, I am the co-chair of Health in the Environment Adaptive Response Task Force, or HART, which is a body within the Canadian Federation of Medical Students Association. HART was founded in 2016 to coordinate advocacy efforts among Canadian medical students regarding current issues in environmental health and climate change. At HART, we spend our time working to integrate planetary health into Canadian me medical school curricula, supporting students across Canada in greening healthcare uh, initiatives, and as well as advocating for climate action and planetary health policies that put the health of Canadians first. One area that HART is aiming to do better at, at this year specifically is environmental justice. Not only is uh, climate change disproportionately impacting Indigenous and marginalized communities in Canada, climate solutions will continue to fall short if Indigenous wisdom is not considered in every step of the way. So I'm so grateful to be here and thank you all for attending. So our overall goal for this webinar series is not only to raise awareness about how unhealthy and unjust policies and pollution are putting the lives of people in Canada at risk, but also to inspire action to change them. And it's particularly exciting for me as a racialized woman in the environmental movement to see that this movement is beginning to listen as it always should have to the voices of people who have been ignored and marginalized for too long. So our topic today is environmental racism in Canada, where we'll be discussing the legacy of how environmental racism threatens the health of Black and Indigenous communities within Canada and learning how to advocate for justice. And we are honored to have two incredible speakers with us today, Dr. Ingrid Waldron and Dr. Ojisto Horn. And we know that a lot of you will have questions as they speak, so we'd encourage you to write them in the Q&A section uh, so we can keep track of them. Dr. Ingrid Waldron is an associate professor in the Faculty of Health at Dalhousie University, the team co-lead of the Improving the Health of People of African Descent flagship at the Healthy Populations Institute at Dalhousie, founder and executive director of the Environmental Noxiousness, Racial Inequities and Community Health Project, or the Enrich Project, and the co-founder of the National Anti-Environmental Racism Coalition. The Enrich Project was launched in 2012 to investigate and document the socioeconomic, political, and health effects of environmental racism in African Nova Scotia and Mi'kmaq communities in Nova Scotia, Canada. The Enrich Project formed the basis to Dr. Waldron's first book, There's Something in the Water, Environmental Racism in Indigenous and Black Communities, which was turned into a 2020 Netflix documentary of the same name and was co-produced by Dr. Waldron, actor Elliot Page, Ian Daniel and Julia Sanderson. Dr. Waldron, um, let's welcome Dr. Waldron to the talk. You're muted, Dr. Waldron. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can, thank you. Okay, once again, thanks for having me. 
here. I'm very excited to, uh, to be here. Uh, so creativity, partnerships, impact. Over the past several years, those three words have described my goals as a professor and researcher at Dalhousie University. While creativity and impact were always objectives I wanted to achieve in my work before I became a university professor, I struggled to come up with ideas that I thought were creative, outside the box, or left of center. I had long admired people who were great at devising innovative and creative ideas, approaches, and tools to address and solve real world problems and wanted to make similar contributions. My desire to create real change in communities through creative and innovative ideas was bolstered by a colleague and a television program. It was the executive director of a community-based organization I was employed at in Toronto in 2007, before I moved to Halifax, who impressed me the most. I had often found myself in awe at the ease with which he was able to come up with creative and left of center services and initiatives that were not only innovative, but also addressed real world challenges for communities that were struggling with income insecurity and poverty, food insecurity, poor health outcomes, and challenges accessing opportunities to start and grow businesses. My desire to create real change in marginalized communities through creativity, partnerships, and impact grew even stronger while I was watching the CNN series, Black in America in 2010. The show highlighted change makers in the African American community who were leading innovative and impactful projects and initiatives that resulted in real change in African American communities. I became even more passionate and committed uh, to doing the same, but continue to struggle to find one or more projects that would allow me to realize this goal. Two years later, in spring 2012, that opportunity landed at my feet when I was approached by an environmental activist to conduct a project on environmental racism in Mi'kmaq and African Nova Scotian communities, a topic I was unfamiliar with and consequently was hesitant to take on. I was hesitant because of my lack of knowledge in the area and because as a sociologist, I did not think I had the right educational background to lead a project on that topic. I assumed that a project on environmental racism could only be effectively led by an environmental scientist or a water expert. When I hesitantly, hesitantly agreed to lead the project, it was, it, it was because it would allow me to work with marginalized communities and because I realized after reading a few articles that it had significant implications for health. As a researcher with expertise uh, around marginalized communities and health, I recognized that I could make a contribution to the topic of environmental racism. In the fall of 2012, I took the first steps in developing the project which became the Environmental Noxiousness, Racial Inequities and Community Health Project or the Enrich Project. The Enrich Project is a collaborative, interdisciplinary, multi-sectoral, community-based research project that is investigating and addressing the social, economic, political, and health effects of environmental racism in rural Mi'kmaq and African Nova Scotian communities across Nova Scotia. The Enrich Project has been successful in engaging a multidisciplinary team that includes Indigenous and African Nova Scotian community members, public health and other government officials, environmental organizations and other NGOs, and professors, researchers, and students in health, sociology, law, environmental science, environmental studies, community health, planning, and political science. But before I continue, I want to kind of address this question that I often get, which is, what is environmental racism? How do we define it? Well, this is how James Desmond, a longtime environmental activist from the African Nova Scotian community of Lincolnville, defined environmental racism at a workshop I held in that community back in 2013. He says the practice has been locating industrial waste sites next to African Nova Scotian, native and poor white communities, communities that don't have a base to fight back. You ask if that's environmental racism, it's environmental racism to its core. Across Canada, environmental chaos has had negative social, political, and health effects in Indigenous and Black communities over the past at least 70 years. Uh, what you see here is Doreen Bernard, one of the grassroots grandmothers, um, who's leading various initiatives to challenge the placement 
of a toxic site in her community. Her community is Sabaganagany First Nation. And it's her community as well as several other communities that has been opposing the development by Alton Gas of a brine discharge pipeline near the Shubanagany River, which would allow natural gas to be stored in underground salt caverns near the river. Uh, concerns have long been raised about the harmful impacts of such a project on the community's health and well being. There's also Pictou Landing First Nation, which you might have heard about. Uh, they had a major achievement uh, in January of last year when the pulp mill was finally closed down. Northern Pulp Mill built a pipeline that had been dumping wastewater into Boat Harbor and Pictou Landing First Nation since 1967. A decision was made by Stephen McNeil last year. Uh, uh, sorry, not last year, but it was actually in 2019, at the end of 2019, to close down the mill on January 31st, 2020, which, as I mentioned, did happen. And we're hearing a lot about Wet'suwet'en First Nation in British Columbia. The hereditary chiefs of the Wet'suwet'en Nation have come out against the coastal gas link pipeline, which seeks to transport liquefied natural gas from Northeast BC to a terminal on the coast near the town of Kitimat. Mass demonstrations, sit-ins, and blockades have ripped parts of Canada over the movement to support the leaders of the Indigenous nations who are opposed to this multi-billion dollar pipeline project in BC. There's also Amdenwang First Nation uh, in or near Sarnia, Ontario's Chemical Valley. And they've long had concerns about air pollution from industrial facilities in the area. Uh, such as oil refineries, power generating stations, and landfills. Chemical Valley is Canada's largest petrochemical complex, grouping over 60 petrochemical facilities within a 25 square kilometer area. High rates of cancer, respiratory illness, and reproductive health issues have long been concerns of the community. When we go to the uh, African Nova Scotian communities, uh, they're about, um, I don't know how much you know about um, African Nova Scotians, but they are a historical uh, black community, uh, the oldest black community in Canada. They've been in Nova Scotia for 300 years and Africville uh, is the most historic example of environmental racism, but also gentrification in, Af in an African Nova Scotian community. So perhaps no other African Nova Scotian community has served as a more classic example and symbol of both gentrification and environmental racism than Africville. Uh, in 1965, the city of Halifax had embarked on an urban renewal campaign resulting in the expropriation or forcible displacement of its residents resulting in the area becoming the host for a number of environmental and social hazards, such as a fertilizer plant, a slaughterhouse, a tar factory, a stone and coal crushing plant, a cotton factory, a prison, three systems of railway tracks, and an open dump. Here's Lincolnville. You saw a photo of James Desmond earlier. This is his community. Uh, Lincolnville has had a first and second generation landfill since 1974. The first one was put there in 1974. The second one was put on top of the first generation landfill in 2006. And like many of these other communities, they have uh, real concerns about cancer and respiratory illness, they would say that uh, increasing rates of cancer since the first generation landfill was cited there. There's also Shelburne. Uh, this is Louise Delisle's community. You might have seen Louise in the film. Um, this is another African Nova Scotian community that has long been concerned about high rates of cancer, specifically multiple myeloma. They have, I believe, one of the highest rates of multiple myeloma uh, in Nova Scotia. And this landfill was placed there in 1943 and everything went into that landfill, syringes and medical waste, et cetera. Um, so they call it the Shelburne Town Dump, um, although it's a landfill, but they, they say it's not a landfill, it's a dump. Um, and, uh, and when I first met with, with Louise at the end of 2015, I was kind of stunned when she said to me that uh, about 95% of the people in her community has cancer. Um, and fam family members have cancer as well, and that the African Nova Scotian men have died out, leaving a community of widows. So I, this brings me to environmental health inequities. One of the main reasons why I took on the project of environmental racism is because I'm a health researcher. I'm very interested in health disparities experienced by racialized communities 
And uh, you know, if you look at the literature over the past 20 years, Canadian literature, uh, it suggests very strongly that high rates of cancer, respiratory illness, reproductive cancers, and other reproductive illnesses and other diseases um, are due uh, to the proximity of communities, uh, particularly racialized communities, to toxic sites. So environmental health inequities is a term that's typically used. Um, environmental health inequities across racial dimensions have been well documented in the literature. And it shows that indigenous and racialized communities in Canada are exposed to greater health risks compared to white communities because they're more likely to be spatially clustered around these waste disposal sites and other environmental hazards. The risks associated with contamination and pollution include, as I said earlier, cancers, in many cases, rare cancers, upper respiratory diseases, cardiovascular disease, reproductive morbidity, including preterm births, temporary liver dysfunction and seizures, et cetera, et cetera. Studies provide evidence that the health effects of environmental racism are also very much gendered and racialized. That's why it's important to look at the intersections of uh, certainly socioeconomic status and race and gender, um, impacting indigenous and black women in very specific and unique ways. Most notably, the impacts on reproductive health, such as infertility, miscarriages, premature births, premature menopause, reproductive system cancers, and an inability to produce healthy children due to compromised endocrine and immune systems while in utero. So what have I been doing over the past, uh, I guess, nine years now, since I started the Enrich Project, I wanted it to be, as I said earlier, collaborative and very much partnered and interdisciplinary and intersectoral and multi-method and multimedia. Um, and through the years, it has become all of those things. Of course, it took some time for that to happen. So I just want to provide a brief overview of some of the activities that have been engaged in over the past nine years. Uh, so, you know, I mentioned earlier that I, in the past, I used to get that question often, what's environmental racism? Never heard about it. Um, don't really get that question anymore, not in Nova Scotia. Uh, that doesn't, you know, I don't want to suggest that everybody knows what uh, environmental racism is, but I, done a lot of um, events um, over the past nine years, every single year since I started and tons of presentations and workshops. So I think in Nova Scotia, at least, uh, people are very much aware of this topic. Um, so just engaging Indigenous and African Nova Scotian communities, both communities in the events that I plan, that I organize. Um, what I find in Nova Scotia is that it's very segregated and you can go to various events and only certain communities are there and not others. And I was committed to ensuring that any event that I would hold would bring together both communities um, so that I can have you know, diversity in my audience, um, which is I find kind of rare in Nova Scotia, uh, but also of course have a diversity of perspectives on the panel. You know, so I like to have politicians like Lenore Zan who's standing, you know, the government perspective like uh, Caroline Wright Parks who you can't see but who's in brown. Doreen Bernard, who you saw walking along the Shubanagadi River, she's in black at the end of the table. Uh, Mary Desmond in blue at the center, no relation to James Desmond, whose photo you saw earlier, but she's in Lincolnville and she's an activist. And then right at the end in green, you've got Lynn Jones, who's a noted social activist. So I continue to do this because I, I know that there's always a need to uh, create awareness. And when you create awareness, you um, people are more empathic around the issue and when people are more empathic around an issue they're more likely to take action. Um, as a scholar of course I need to write uh, write books and write journal articles and this is my first book there's something in the water which was published by Fernwood Publishing in April of 2018 and this was merely a response to some of the uh, arguments that I've seen over the past few years about environmental racism but also trying to redefine the parameters of critique around the environmental racism lens, particularly the use, uh, the overuse of the term environmental justice, which for me is not the correct term. Uh, environmental justice is what we want to achieve, but environmental racism is the condition and we can't decide, you know, what the tools are to achieve environmental racism unless we talk about environmental racism, which is the condition. So you guys are doctors, environmental racism is the condition, it's the diagnosis, environmental justice includes the tools that you would use to address environmental racism. 
So I find this problematic in the Canadian literature, this refusal or hesitance to use the term race and to talk about it and to name it and say it's environmental racism, instead using the term environmental justice to obscure uh, the centrality of race in this particular issue. So that's one of the main arguments I take up in the book, as, as well as kind of looking at the history of grassroots resistance uh, among Indigenous and Black communities over the years. Obviously, the work that I'm doing, I'm doing it on their backs. So I wanted to um, provide a bit of a journey of uh, successes and disappointments that these communities have experienced over the years. Of course, I wanted to talk about health. So I have a whole chapter on environmental health inequities, et cetera, et cetera. So this this was an important book for me to kind of condense the scholarship, the Canadian scholarship in one place um, with respect to environmental racism in both communities. Uh, that was also important to me. This is a mapping project that was done for by my research, research assistant for the Enrich project. Um, this is on my website. Um, you have one layer for indigenous communities or Mi'kmaq communities in Nova Scotia and another layer for African Nova Scotian communities. This was really important because it actually maps the location of indigenous or sorry, Mi'kmaq and African Nova Scotian communities across Nova Scotia. So people can actually see that these communities truly are near to landfills and pulp and paper mills. I mean, a lot of people doubted what I was saying early on, you know, and they would email me and say, it's not about race, it's about class. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of comments that they, they made, you know, by on email or um, in the media, they didn't believe uh, that this is real. And so I thought it was important to map uh, the cases of environmental racism across Nova Scotia. And here we are, and for some people, you know, this actually convinced them. They contacted me and said, okay, I can see it. I can see it now. Okay, <laughs> I believe it now. Um, so it's a data collection tool, but it's also something that I can use to take with me to, you know, to meet with policymakers. It's another form of data collection that I think provides strong evidence of the reality of environmental racism in Nova Scotia. This isn't part of the Enrich Project, Rural Water Watch, but it's an NGO that I co-founded in 2017 with a few environmental scientists. So this evolved out of my Enrich Project because I wanted to provide effective communities with something, something tangible, right? We could do a lot of research and research takes time. And I thought to myself, what can we do that's much more immediate? Well, we can test their water because all of these communities that we're working with, they just want somebody to test their water and tell them what's in their water. They don't necessarily want government to do it because they don't trust government. But we could do this work and give them give them that information immediately. So water testing has been done in Lincolnville and Shelburne. We go back to the community and we do workshops. We discuss the link between contaminated water um, and health. Uh, and we are currently doing annual healthy wells day because a lot of the communities have cracked wells or old wells and we want them to know that that's a health risk so we build capacity in these communities to keep their wells healthy we also through the this ngo we train environmental science students university students and college students like the nova scotia community college um, and we also train or build capacity of homeowners to test their own water Ecojustice has also been important to the Enrich Project. Ecojustice is a law charity across Canada, different offices in Canada. They opened up an office in Halifax in 2018, and I met with them, and uh, they are, you know, trying to examine legal remedies to address environmental racism in some of the communities here. But what, what was also great is that we were able to provide them with water testing evidence. Uh, to build their case. So it was great that we had the water testing samples and the results from our, our work with Rural Water Watch. We were able to hand some of that over to them so they can build their case. I'm also uh, collaborating with Let's Sprout, uh, two uh, young women, uh, former DAL students, who decided that uh, you know it's important to embed environmental racism into the high school and middle school curricula. Uh, so they met with me and we discussed this and we said, yeah, what we need first, though, is we need to develop creative and innovative tools for teachers to use in the classroom to teach about environmental racism. That's that's much more immediate. A uh, long term, it's about how do we transform the Nova Scotia curricula, the high school and middle school curricula, so that teachers are much more equipped to teach about environmental racism in their classrooms. They have the right tools. They feel comfortable doing it. 
um, and students are learning about environmental racism in a different way. Um, the truth is the leaders of today would not have had the benefit of this type of education. And if we're trying to prepare young people, 14 year olds and 15 year olds to lead environmental movements and to work at the departments of environment, then they need to have the right analysis. That's, that's what I feel is the kind of the root of the problem is that the people in power don't have the right analysis. Um, so this project is about providing teachers and students with the right analysis around environmental racism. I've also just recently uh, completed work with Climate Action Services um, to do climate change workshops in three African Nova Scotian communities, a total of 34 participants participated in February and March of this year, and the report was just released uh, last week. Uh, this is to build capacity in African Nova Scotian communities to address climate change impacts and to look at the social, economic, political, and health effects of climate change in African Nova Scotian communities. The goal, of course, is to ensure that African Nova Scotian communities are climate ready. And as I said, to build their capacity around climate change adaptation. Uh, the workshops went really well. Some people didn't know anything about climate change um, and they thought the workshops were too short. Um, I was worried that they would not be engaged in this topic because I would say that this is not a topic that African Nova Scotian communities are most engaged in. Um, so it's been hard, even around environmental racism, it's been hard to engage them in these topics, uh, but they loved the workshops. It was facilitated by Climate Action Services and they're a group of retired environmental professionals. Um, yeah, so hopefully we can do more in African Nova Scotian communities. There are 48 African Nova Scotian communities. We only reached three. So if we can get some more funding, it would be great to do more. I train students, of course, and what I've noticed over the years is how interdisciplinary environmental racism is because um, on my research teams, I have students and faculty from geography and sociology and environmental science and environmental studies and planning and medicine and political science. I've recognized throughout this project that everyone has a stake in, in the issue of environmental racism, but through a different perspective. So it has been really thrilling for me to be able to connect with faculty and students in diverse disciplines and to learn from them. Multimedia is really important. I, you know, this is about raising awareness, certainly, and I try to do it uh, in multiple ways. Of course, social media, traditional media, podcasts, um, chats, I try to make use of everything in order to kind of build capacity in communities, to teach, to, uh, to promote, um, and to create awareness. So this is something, once again, like my community engagement events, I will continue to do, because there's always somebody who's never heard of environmental racism across Canada. And here is Elliot Page. So this was particularly exciting when i woke up one morning and i went to my twitter page i noticed actor elliot page following me didn't understand why why me i said to myself and i realized a few weeks later that it was indeed elliot page reached out dm'd him thanked him for promoting my book and the project and for supporting the communities uh, we connected late 2018 and early 2019, the second time with members of the grassroots grandmothers, and we eventually decided that a 70 minute film would be ideal, it would be a great way to reach a wide audience. We didn't know that it was going to go to TIFF, um, which it did. Um, we just got in by the deadline, almost, um, almost, well not really, <laughs> but we were allowed in. <laughs> because somebody's friends with somebody. Um, yeah, so we, it was screened September 9th of 2019. This was, this was uh, so much fun. One of the best times of my life, running around to different media outlets and giving interviews to international media. So you know, we talk often in academia about knowledge mobilizing. Um, this was the kind of highest form of knowledge mobilizing, you know, Time Magazine, Los Angeles Times, et cetera, et cetera. Many of the you know, magazines, outlets that I read we were able to speak with them about this this particular topic and raise even more awareness uh, and then it went to netflix and of course this is even greater knowledge mobilization because you know i heard from people around the world 
who have been inspired by the women in the film. You know, that's been really kind of touching to me how inspired uh, people have been looking at Louise and Doreen and all the women in the film. This has been truly a gift to be able to uh, have the movie streaming on Netflix. Uh, that's been since uh, March 29th of last year. What's also exciting for me is the bill, a uh, bill that I helped develop in 2015 as a Nova Scotia private member's bill on environmental racism never became legislation. Lenore Zan uh, reached out to me in February of last year and she said, I want to put it forward as a national strategy, a federal bill. And I said, yep, that's great because we know that there are you know, many Indigenous communities across Canada that are dealing with pipelines, et cetera, et cetera. So of course, a national strategy is best. It's not simply confined to one province. Uh, so the first reading, the first reading um, happened on February 26th. The second reading, it went to second reading uh, December 8th of last year. And then the second hour of that debate was held on March 23rd of this year. And surprisingly, it was approved. Uh, this is the first time ever. It's gone to second reading. It was, it went to second reading when it was a provincial Nova Scotia bill back in 2015, but it wasn't approved. So this for me is a, is a big achievement. It's a small achievement in many ways because it's not legislation yet, but it's a big achieve achievement for me because Lenore and I have been working on this since 2015, January. Uh, so it's right now at committee. I believe it's, yes, committee. And I'm actually gonna be speaking with Lenore Zan on Wednesday. Uh, about this bill. Lenore invited me to talk about it to the Environment Committee. So that's going to be, I believe it's 3.30 Eastern time. I also formed late last year, a national coalition to address environmental racism with a partner in Toronto, Maolo Charles. He reached out to me in the summer of last year and he said, I know what you're doing in Nova Scotia. I love what you're doing, but have you ever thought about making it national? I said, I always wanted the Enriched Project to be national, but it just wasn't the right time. And we decided to form a national coalition, which has brought together over 50 different organizations in the environment and climate sector areas across Canada, including the David Suzuki Foundation and Environmental Defense, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the purpose of this is to bring these groups together to share expertise, ideas, and resources with the end goal of addressing environmental racism in Indigenous, Black, immigrant, and racialized communities across Canada. We do our work through six uh, working groups. I don't know if, I, if I'm out of time, but... Uh, I wanted to talk about how doctors can help address environmental racism. Please let me know if I'm out of time. No, you're good. You've, you've, uh, you've got three minutes left. Okay. So how can doctors um, help to address environmental racism? Well, there are several ways. Uh, when we think of just curriculum, medical faculties and professors in medicine need to embed issues of social and environmental determinants of health into their curricula in more significant ways. I don't feel this is happening. It's not happening in Nova Scotia, as far as I know. So that medical students uh, are better equipped with an understanding of the health outcomes that arise from environmental racism and the environmental determinants of health and how to act on these health outcomes when they graduate and start to practice. Doctors should play a bigger role in sharing information about environmental racism and its health impacts in the media, since doctors have a considerable amount of power that comes from their expertise and influence. While doctors often use the media, as a platform to share their knowledge about various social and health issues. It is rare that I see a doctor discussing the issue of environmental racism and its health impacts in the Canadian media. It's important that doctors know how to assess for environmental health risks. This includes inventories and history questions that cover environmental issues as part of the general assessment. Doctors also need to develop educational and other health promotion interventions to help clients understand and where possible decrease environmental health risks related to water contamination and pollution. Doctors need to be involved in advocacy around environmental racism by collaborating with affected communities, government agencies, and other stakeholders to develop interventions that will help to address environmental racism. Uh, this may include writing letters and op-eds to local newspapers responding to environmental health issues affecting communities, serving as credible sources of information at community gatherings, formal government hearings, and professional forums, participating as committee members 
on community committees that focus on environmental racism and environmental health inequities, volunteering to serve on federal and provincial committees that focus on environmental issues and environmental justice, and finally collaborating with MPs and other politicians to develop environmental racism and environmental justice bills and legislation. And I don't think I have enough time, but I, I was asked to talk about how CAPE members can support different initiatives, but we could talk about that when we do the, the question and answer. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Waldron. You've, I think you've given us a really solid idea of what environmental racism is, why we need to frame our ideas around environmental justice in, in the idea that, in fact, uh, the problem is environmental racism and some solid ideas about what we can do to move forward and what you're doing to move forward. It's it's incredible, actually, all the all the work you're involved in, and we, we need more of that. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Celia um, to introduce Dr. Horn. Thank you, Dr. Waldron, and thank you, Melissa. I'm very honored to welcome Dr. Ojusto Horn. Dr. Horn is a CAPE board member and a revered family physician currently serving the Aklisasne Mohawk community, an area comprised of 25,000 people straddling the American, Canadian, and Ontario Quebec borders. Dr. Horn completed her Bachelor of Science in Anatomy and Cell Biology and a Master's in Epidemiology and Biostatistics at McGill University, then worked as a researcher for the Kanawake School Diabetes Prevention Program. She paused this work to pursue medical school at the University of British Columbia, then completed McGill's Family Medicine Residency Program with a fellowship in maternal and child health. As a traditional minded woman, mother, family physician, and student of history and politics, we are so fortunate to have Dr. Horn with us here today to speak of, about how environmental racism has impacted the health of the community she serves and loves. Thank you, Dr. Horn. Thank you. Um, I had a hard time um, figuring out how to share my slides, so I'm going to have to have Melissa do this for me. <clears throat> okay, so everybody can see that slide, I imagine. So, um, so Gwe, um, my name is Ojisto uh, Gunawaherde Horn. I'm a Haudenosaunee or Mohawk as is commonly understood. I um, am Bear Clan and I um, grew up um, on the Ganawage uh, community right near Montreal. My uh, mother is from Ganawage and my father is from Akwazesne. Um, did you wanna go into the slideshow? There you go, okay. And so, um, yeah, so I wanted to uh, talk today about, um, actually, I, I spend a lot of time trying to figure out why, what are the roots of whatever um, is uh, happening right now? I'm very much a family doctor, a community doctor, a person who is interested in history and of course, culture. So this is a picture of my mom um, 50 years ago. Um, that's me in the corner. And it's a big rock in Gunawage and, uh, somebody had painted this is Indian land and this rock was there for a very long time I think something happened to it and they repainted a different rock but the reason why I wanted to um, to mention this is because you know we really are these um, we really do all come from um, backgrounds that are really really varied and we are all you know, going through time and eventually we're going to meet up at some point where we all are going to have to think about the same thing and that is the health of the planet, the health of the earth. And so I have spent a lot of time thinking about this and, um, and so I will um, talk today about three particular communities that I'm very, um, very passionate about. That's Gahnawage, where I grew up, my mom's reserve, my father's reserve, which is uh, Akwazasne, and then a community that I've been um, working with closely called Grassy Narrows in Northern Ontario. So if you can switch the, the slide, please. So before we do um, back in our communities, before we, um, we, we 
carry on, we um, usually have to start with setting our minds um, into one spot. Um, every time we walk into a meeting or any kind of gathering, we carry with us all of the um, baggage from whatever happened at home, or if you stubbed your toe, or you know somebody said something to you, and you're carrying a conversation in your mind. And so when you are at a meeting, you may not be you know right there. And also the focus of what you're uh, what you're going to discuss is not always explicit. So I'd like to uh, just say a few words, and these are the Ohondo Gardi. The Ahonda Gordi Wadakwa is a, a very long speech. I'm going to be very, very short. Um, and basically, it's to remind um, us um, as human beings of our place um, in the world inside nature. So um, we would typically start with, uh, well, Aguegu, hello, everybody. Aguegu, Skana, Ganjokwa would be hello. So with a huntzio, Scott Nigari West, and Nagadi, Ne, a Honda Gardi Wadekum, and go on a headstone. Unguesun, a Guegun Scan, a Gahage, the day with a wardy and a Ganta Hutzage, the Wanderdom, Tonio Duhak, Nilguat Nigurdom. So I've said, hello, everybody. We're going to bring our minds together and we're going to think today about this one thing. We're going to first think about the people and we are all moving about this land and we are all doing our thing. But we always have to keep in mind that we need to get along with each other. We have to get we have to have peace. We also have to think about the, the earth, our mother, and how she has provided everything for us. And so we have been able to live comfortably here. It hasn't been easy, but right now we definitely live comfortably. A guego onscon de what wet nuni no, what nigura dun de tinu who were adune, um, um, ne, um, Gahnegardun, you ne edzi sego, you kill the ganhus ne edzi sego, um, 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 I'm sorry, I'm, I'm suddenly nervous because I've realized what I'm doing. I'm speaking to a lot of people. What we do is we think about the water and the importance of the water, how when we're really thirsty, it quenches our, our breath. And when we're speaking, it quenches our mouth and it allows words to come out clearly. And it also, in actual, it comes from the four winds, the directions, and what it does is it washes away all the bad things and it brings it away from us. Unfortunately, now we have um, a big problem with with, uh, the oceans which have collected all of this this um, this um, bad things and uh, we have problems with the health of our of our waters in the ocean I should also mention we also think about the waters that we were um, that we were developed in that being the amniotic fluid the 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 first waters and um, the waters in our tears and our blood and in the the rivulets and the waters on the um, on the dew um, um, every every morning um, the water and the brooks and the streams and the rivers and the salt water and the fresh water and just all the water. It is really what is what life is. It's the most important. Um, it's, it's so important. Um, we have to think about, um, and, and, and so this goes on and on and on. And we think about the, um, the Odinoa which would be the um, which would be the bugs, the small things that we can't see, and how important they are to regenerate the earth and to, um, to recycle things and to bring things back to their component parts. But also the things that we can't see that can hurt us, like right now we're going through COVID and being exposed to things that uh, we don't understand and our bodies haven't seen before. But we really do have to recognize that they're part of the earth and that we have to figure out how to get along with it. We uh, bring our minds, we think about the fish, the no-legged, like the like the um, um, like like the snakes, um, the um, other two legged, like the chimpanzees, the other apes, um, the four legged, the animals. We think about um, about the grasses, the um, all of the, right now. We're going through planting. We're getting ready for planting season. So we have the seeds, we have the roots, and some of the roots that we um, will 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 grind up into medicines that that help us and nourish us. We have our uh, crops, the three sisters, the corns, the beans, and the squash, and the other crops around the earth that have made us um, made us um, able to uh, domesticate them and to live and to grow our um, our civilizations. And we give, you know, an acknowledgement to um, the wild berries, um, like the strawberries. We, um, which is what we would say is the very first, um, the very first or the most important of our um, fruits. We give our acknowledgement to. Um, 
the trees right now we have um Wata ceremony which is the um which is the maple syrup which we um tap every year at this time and we use it to cleanse our bodies we drink it and after a very long winter of being inside and not eating necessarily healthy good food we drink the sap to clean ourselves out um, we give our minds and think about the birds who um provide um provide um, us, um, let, we hear their voices and their songs and we know that they are still here. And that at that moment um, in the middle of the morning when they wake up, just as the light uh, is switched on from night to light, um, that is a really sacred time where we pay attention and, um, and, and have really good thoughts, especially if we have prayers that uh, we really want to uh, be heard. That's the best time to say that. And that's at the same time as the birds wake up and we give our minds, we think about um, the four winds, the four directions, the waters that they bring. And most recently we heard the first thunder where the thunder woke up the earth to let everything start up again with the new season. And we think about um, the, um, the four beings, we have beings that, um, sacred beings that have um, protected us. We have to think about our big brother, the sun, who is um, here to um, like a very good big brother, very um, trustworthy. Every day is up and making sure that we have the warmth and all of the, the, um, the sustenance that he provides us. And then his, his um, sister, but our grandmother, the moon, who is um, um, there to help with fertility and with the seasons and, um, and um, very important with the cycles, especially with the oceans and with women. And, um, and just recently she came up in the sky and was in the same sky at the same time as the sun came up. So they greeted each other because sometimes they help each other. Um, and we think about the about our ancestors who are in the stars and how um, and how the stars can sometimes act like a blanket to to cover up the um, to cover up our um, grandmother so that she is comforted at night. We also think about the mind inside nature, Goa, this huge energy that thought about all of this and it's not a female it's not male it's just a, a mind inside nature we think about some quiet dism which is creator we think about jujujism who is the sky woman the first woman and we think about um and we think about all of that energy to make all of this happen so um, we're going to bring all of these things to get in, into our minds and think about that right now as we talk about the environment and where our place is in this environment. And um, with those um, words and with now all our minds in this spot, I'd like to continue on with this presentation. So you can, you can change the slide. So when I was very young, I uh, always had this on my wall. It's uh, a poster, it's a very classic poster. Only after the last tree has been cut down, only after the last river has been poisoned, only after the last fish has been caught, only then will you know that money cannot be eaten. And so I, I grew up for a very, very long time being very, very aware of the environment. Of course, with the Hondo Party with Dequa and the different teachings that have been um, are in my family. But this is something that is really um, very much um, um, sort of on, on par with most Indigenous um, uh, traditions or, or thoughts, um, culture, just really recognizing that, you know, there is a limit. Um, the things that we have, there's a finite capacity of the earth to be able to sustain what we, um, what we, um, that what we live right now. And so, um, I mean, this is something that I knew as a small child. Can you change the slide? And the reason I'm here today is um, I wanted to um, talk about a few specific um, um, points. I want to talk about the Indian Act very quickly, the um, Environmental Protection Act of 1999. I want to talk a little bit about the Idle No More movement of 2012. And I want to talk specifically about things that happened in Ghanawage, Akwesasne, and Grassy Narrows. And I want to talk for a few moments about the focus for physicians. But most importantly, I want to tell you about this basket. So in our, you know, family doctors, we are specifically um, capable of taking care of people in all parts of the life cycle. So that would be conception, birth, childhood, adult, um, adolescence, adulthood, and motherhood, fatherhood, 
uh, menopause, andropause, and of course, death. And so for every single part of the life cycle, we have a different basket that commemorates that change in the life cycle. So we have ceremonies that are, are there to remind us of the changes that are happening in our bodies, in our minds, our emotions, our spirit at those really important junctures in our life. And so right now, I have gone from the point where I would be a mother with my great big basket full of all the things that you have as a mom, you know, the big mom bag, which has everything in it. And I had to empty it out. And now I'm putting all my medicines in it. That's all my knowledge, all the things that I've learned over the course of my life. You know, my children are grown up now and they have, you know, in university, I have six kids and they're all doing, you know, and I've learned a lot from being their mother. And so I've been really concentrating on, on them. And now that they have grown, now I can start to think about my medicine basket. And so now I'm filling it up with knowledge. And one of the most important parts of this stage in my life is that I'm supposed to teach. I'm supposed to become an elder and I'm supposed to teach about all of the reflections that I've had in all of the people that I've met and put it all together in a bundle and be able to present it. And so that is why I have spent a lot of time thinking about the things that I'll share with you today. You can, you can change the slide. <laughs> So we all know about the, um, um, the British North American Act in 1867, and we know, you know, John A. Macdonald, and, you know, they had in this act described, you know, um, the federal government and the different provinces and the territory, well, not at that time, but, um, and, and gave different um, mandates for each level of government, including municipalities. And so um, everything was very evenly divided. But one thing that was, um, sort of set apart was how to deal with uh, indigenous people. Well, at the, at the time we call them Indians, we're Indians. And so this is an Indian act. And so um, the term Indian is actually a political um, definition. And so that's why a lot of Indians will still use Indians because it's a political, it's a legal definition, I should say. And it's because there are rights um, and, and um, that are um, part of it. Now the Indian act, it, um, it has so many different parts to it. And it's, um, but one of the most important important parts is the um, intention of it. And what it was, was to um, be able to define who we were. So we no longer had the ability to define our citizenship. It now became the can Canadian or the crown that defined us. And it also was a way um, it said, you know what, we're going to make all these treaties and these treaties, these, these agreements exist between you and the crown and they will exist as long as one Indian of at least 50% blood walks on that land. And when that ceases to happen, then it's no longer, the land is no longer yours and it is now um, Canada or the crowns. And so that was the, set the stage for all of the assimilation policies that happened in which there was, an, a, we were identified, we, we, we had to, um, we were identified as being 50% or more. And there was all these ways that you could lose your status. If you went to school, if you went, became a lawyer, if you went and, um, you know, were, was in the army, you, you know, if you got it, if you bought, a, bought something like a piece of land, you would be enfranchised and you would lose your status. And so that was the way that they took away um, our, um, our numbers, but then they also put us on reserves and those reserves were never ever meant to be places that we could thrive and that we could live and we could you know, carry on the way that we had in, for time and memoriam. Those were places that were so inhospitable that we would eventually give up and leave and go, but go to the city. And so then eventually there would be no more of us and Canada would have all the land and go carry on with the way that they had um, envisioned um, land proprietorship, um, um, you know, 150 years ago or whatever. So, um, so that's the basis for why that's so important um, to understand why these structural things continue to exist because it all has to do with the land. Could you um, change the um, slide? So as I said, it's a principal statute with the federal government administers in Indian status, local First Nations government and the management of reserve lands and communal monies. You can change the next. 
1999, we had the Canadian Environmental Protection Act. It's an act respecting pollution prevention and protection of the environment and human health in order to contribute to sustainable development. So the thing that I always was very surprised about was this whole, um, was to contribute to sustainable development. It was always about development of the natural resources. And I was like, why can't we just leave it and let it just like, you know, be, but no, it's all about the development because Canada is a natural resource extraction economy. That's how Canada was formed and that's how it continues to be, to, to manage on its economy. So um, the federal act, uh, the, so the CEPA is a federal act. It's enforced by the provinces and the territories, but there's a huge regulatory gap because um, it doesn't cover those lands that are um, crown lands um, and those those on which Indians live on, like the reserves. And so there's this, so it doesn't, um, it doesn't, so there's no, there's no um, way to enforce regulatory, um, regulatory policies um, or laws as defined in the um, CEPA on our communities and, and, this, and usually surrounding them. And that is one of the reasons why we have so many big industries right beside our reserves, because there's no environmental protection, or it's very hard. It's very, it's not, certainly not something that you can uh, depend on based on the CEPA. Can you turn the next uh, slide? So the question, are, the, are there environmental or human health issues of concern to First Nations that are not being addressed, including, for example, the management of waste, in particular hazardous waste on reserve lands, increased methylmercury levels caused by the creation of hydroelectric dams, the cleanup of contaminated sites, the cumulative impacts of chemicals in the environment, and the rates of cancers in First Nation people and animals, fish, and birds. So does this act actually take care of all these things? And I would argue absolutely not. In 2012, um, four women um, came together. They were talking about this new omnibus bill that was going to be passed by Stephen Harper. And in there, there was a whole bunch of bills and they were gonna lump them all together and sign them off. And one particular part of that bill had to do with, um, with the protection of water. So the way that the, um, that from what I understand, I'm, I have not, I'm not, I'm a doctor. I am a community member. I, you know, I would love to have a long conversation if I'm saying anything wrong, please let me know. But from what I understood is that um, the waters are protected, not just the primary tributaries into the main um, oceans like the Arctic, the Pacific and the Atlantic, but also the secondary tributaries. And so that's a quite a big, a big land space. And from what I understand, this particular bill was going to only was decreasing the protection from the secondary tributaries and only going to include the primary tributaries, which would have changed the, um, the amount of already weakened laws to protect our environment in our communities. Our people who live in, um, in these very remote places would have even weaker protection of their, of their environment. Um, the other thing too was um, very concerning is that um, there's a lot of people who have a lot of, um, in our communities, who have a lot of need. Uh, we don't have a lot of economic viability. And the easiest thing to do is to allow, is to have some private land, which is still crown land, but, um, and then allow an industry to come on and dump or do something to the land without having to go through the same amount of rigorous um, checks and balances that you would have to do if you were anywhere else. And so we were very concerned about that. Oh, you can change the next uh, slide. So I'm going to talk right now about Gunawage. Gunawage is where I grew up. It's a, a community of about maybe 10,000 people. Um, we're just south of Montreal, what, about 15 minutes away. And, um, and I'm going to talk about um, what happened, um, my gosh, in about the 60s. Um, so this is a picture of my mom. My mom was, uh, her name is Gahandi Horn. She was a really big activist in the 60s. Um, she was a model and she was one of the very first people to use her status um, as her a media personality to start talking about um, really important issues. She talked about women's rights and women's health. She talked about um, all sorts of social issues that were happening in the day and, and a lot about environmental um, concerns. So the one I wanna to talk to you about is um, we had this, um, um, this family in our community in Gahanawage who, um, 
you know, went and, and allowed the dumping of um, 33 municipalities from around Montreal and including Montreal to dump in our tiny little four or five by five kilometer uh, community and to dump um, their stuff into onto their land in the community. And they did this for um, years and years and years and they're developed a huge um, rat problem. And, um, but, you know, on the funny side is um, big companies like Labatt's, you know, if they had, you know, um, you know, put their, their, uh, their labels upside down, well, then they would bring it to the dump. So sometimes there was some very viable stuff in the dump. So I remember my mom saying that one time somebody opened up a bar and, you know, was selling for five cents a bottle, the, the beer, because, you know, the, the, because the labels were on upside down. And also, you know, linoleum that was, you know, garbage. So people all had in the community at one time, the same linoleum in their kitchen floors that they got from the dump. So, you know, people were pilfering through there and getting some really viable stuff because we were not very we didn't have a lot of money back then and um, but when the municipalities got whole wind of the fact that we were actually using this stuff well no way and so they started to wreck the stuff before they put it in the dump so it was no longer viable which I thought that was not very nice if you're going to throw something out let somebody use it in any case um, that the, the other thing that happened was um, and so, so, so my mother um, and, a, and a group of people, clan mothers, they collect a whole bunch of rats and mice and they ended up going to Indian Affairs um, in Ottawa and they had a big presentation and to make a long story short, the rats got out and they went all over the place and they caused all sorts of havoc. And, um, and but it brought a lot of attention to what was happening in the community about um, all of these, this rat problem. And so um, it, it took another several years, but it eventually did um, stop the dump closed down. But the important point is that we needed to have external control. All of the, all of the internal um, demonstrations of the people against the band council, as well as this family, did nothing to stop this dumping. And, um, and it took um, a lot of external support for it to finally um, stop. At about the same time, we had a community, um, a community member, a family, who um, allowed for a another dump. And this dump happened, um, people were bringing people, companies, all the way down from South, uh, South Carolina would drive all the way north into, you know, across the border into Montreal, right to our little reserve, and then right down and go and dump. And they were dumping um, wastes, things that um, like chemicals, stuff that, um, stuff that there was zero regulation. And, and even today, you can't go in there. And they say the snow never melts there. But the thing is, it's a big, it's about a quarter of our entire community that we can't go to because of the dumping. And so, you know, it rains, it snows, it goes down into the water table, and then it goes underneath our community. And, you know, we have a lot of health issues. And, and how do you measure whether or not it's related to all of that garbage and the toxicity of the stuff that was put there without, uh, with our knowledge, but definitely not our consent? Could you uh, change the next slide? So this is the community of Gunawage. You can see it's all the green stuff. It's an aerial view. And so it's the green. It looks like about a square. It's about four to five kilometers by four. So about 16 to 20 square miles. If you can move to the next slide. So that big spike base there is that, oh, back it up. <laughs> That big red um, space is the area that nobody goes to. It's a massive space. And, um, and so um, our community is shoveled into this tiny little area and we're surrounded by all these French speaking communities and for the most part do not like us. And every time we don't have any um, advocacy, um, nobody, the only voice that we can have is to block that mercy bridge and then people will listen to us. And so that's why we have such a bad rep because nobody listens to us unless we do something like block a bridge and then everybody is very excited. And then, the, you know, what happened in 90 with the army came in and anyways, it was, there was race riots and it was just a horrific, horrific summer of 1990. And, and, uh, and that's not the, pro the, the topic of today's discussion, but what is the topic is that a lot of native people are not listened to. And the only recourse they have is a pub is demonstrations and to embarrass somebody and then people will start to listen and pay attention. But the repercussions are often pretty big and we usually suffer those. Can you, the next slide? 
Ganya Darawanana is the big waterway of the St. Lawrence River, and it's a female liver. It has a liver, river, it has a spirit, and, um, and it passes by Ganawagi, but it also passes by Akwazasne, which is the land where the partridge jump, drums. You can see on the, on, down below, I have, um, you know, a, a satellite view. You can see the Ottawa River, and it heads up to Montreal, and below it, you see the, the St. Lawrence River come up, and of course, it goes off into the St. Lawrence River. You can see Lake Champlain that goes straight down to New York City. We were in the perfect position where the French, the English, the Dutch, and then later Canada, Quebec, the United States, we're right where they all meet. And sure enough, today we have all three jurisdictions in our community. It is a very complicated place to live. In the picture that you see where the river is on the uh, west side, that little peninsula, that's um, that's America, but a little bit first, like New York, it's in New York, a little bit further down river, it's Quebec. And of course, on the left-hand side, that's Ontario. And I work there as a family doctor carrying a um, Ontario and a Quebec health, um, health uh, life. Uh, medical license. I don't yet have an, um, a New York State license. Maybe that'll be something I'll do in the future, but it's a very complicated place to work. The next slide, please. So in the um, 50s, early 50s, there was a great big dam called the Moses Sonder Dam that was put between um, across the St. Lawrence River, um, just, just um, west um, or upstream um, between Messina, New York and Cornwall, Ontario. And because of that dam, all, all sorts of very cheap hydroelectricity was provided to the area. And so if you look on the, um, on, um, just below at that map, you'll see, a, um, you'll see a, um, a sort of like a, it kind of looks like a red blood cell. <laughs> and it, um, and that's Cornwall Island. That's part of our, our reserve. And around it, you're gonna see six red dots. And those are all incredibly huge, super fund sites on the American side and the equivalent of a super fund site on the Canadian side. And these are known to be um, um, very dangerous for the health of the people who live within their area. So here we have Cornwall Island. We have, uh, we have a, 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 I don't know if I'm allowed to, yeah, General Motors, um, which was um, decommissioned in 2012. We have, um, we have um, Alcoa, we have Reynolds Aluminum, we have DuPont Pulp and Paper, uh, Quartal's um, Textiles, and we also have um, the CIL um, um, Domtar Pulp and Paper, DuPont Chemicals. So we have six, all sorts of different industries with clean, ele I mean, cheap electricity that um, we're dumping into the area. And the reason it's so difficult to, um, to manage the area is because there's different jurisdictions. You've got provincial, two different provinces, a state, two different federal, and you have an indigenous reserve on crown lands. What a mess. You can, and so yes, in McLean's, this is from 1971, it was considered one of the most uh, um, dirtiest places. It was a place unfit for man or beast. I think now um, there are other places that have um, got the dubious distinction and first prize, but uh, we had that for, for some time. So um, there's a whole mix of chemicals in the water, in the soil, in the air. Um, and we, before, we were a thriving community. We were self-sufficient. We had our dairy. We had, um, we had a dairy cattle industry. We grew our own food. We, our, our men fished. We, were, um, we had honeybees. We had like a very thriving economy. And our men also worked away in the um, high steel and they would um, bring home money and um, from building bridges and high steel across North America. And then in the mid 80s, because of all of this, there was all sorts of studies that were done because suddenly people were um, bringing and that's a very long story. I'm being very, very short. And suddenly we were um, basically told that we could no longer um, um, eat the fish we were suggested we could not eat the, from the gardens. We could not um, eat from the lands. We lost our dairy industry. Every single thing that existed that we were able to um, thrive off um, was uh, removed and uh, removed from our, um, from our economy. And so we, and, and I won't go into a lot of detail, but that's when um, our, um, that's when our um, industry went into cigarettes. 
and now it's guns and it's pot and it's all these other and a casino all these things that Aguazasne is known for um, is a direct result of us trying to find an economy because our land has been completely destroyed. The next one. By contaminating our food chain, including mother's milk with toxic compounds such as PCBs, dioxins, DDT, and many others, corporate society has removed from us our very ability to feed ourselves, our families, and our communities. Next slide. Exposure to toxic contaminants in the environment, the air, water, soils, local food, fish, wildlife, and mother's milk has re resulted in a rapidly changing epidemiology among Native people. That's from Gudzi Cook. Gudzi Cook is one of the original people who headed the um, National Council of Aboriginal Midwives. She's my aunt and taught me about, a lot about, um, about midwifery and a lot about delivering babies and culture and, um, and a lot about um, environmental justice and environmental racism and environmental, like all the toxicities because she was a really big part in some of the studies that happened here in which they were measuring um, milk, blood, urine, Everything you could think of. So many studies have been done in Akwazasne, but in her, in the case that she was involved in, it had to do with the mother's milk. And so they were told that the milk is full of PCBs, but you know what else are they going to do? So they there was a big there was a lot of um, um, a lot of consternation. Do we um, do we allow our women to breastfeed our babies? And um, they did. And but there's always been a hint, like when I breastfed my babies, did I cause harm because of the PCBs? Next slide, please. So it, recently I've been working uh, for about two years up in a place called Grassy Narrows. Grassy Narrows is a community in northeast, northwestern Ontario. And um, back in the 70s, the, um, in Dryden, there was a um, there was a pulp and paper mill which dumped um, tons and tons of um, of inorganic mercury into the water and the and grassy narrows happens to be in this water um, the within that water table and even today if you put your hand into the water you can still feel the mercury on the on the rocks 200 kilometers away from the original dump site and there has been a persistent pervasive prenatal childhood, young adult and adulthood level of mercury exposure. The people there used to be like um, completely didn't have welfare. Everybody was working, everybody was eating fish, everybody was very healthy. And then this happened and now um, there's um, maybe a 25% employment rate, but I, the unemployment rate, I don't know what the it is, but there's not a lot of people working and there's not a lot of elders. Um, there have severe, severe um, um, systemic um, effects of mercury exposure. And there are so many problems related um, to a profound mercury exposure that are actually different than the mercury exposure that we, list, that we learn in medical school in Japan. And when they had the Minamata um, exposure, it was from organ inorganic mercury being dumped all at once. Boom! It was, it, and, and the children had this this um, this um, exposure that was um, finite. In this case, it's continuous and it's been changed to methylmercury. It's become organic, and it is all throughout the entire systems and um, and in the environment. And so the people have um, profound neurological effects that are are very different from Minamata disease. And when they go to the hospitals, um, for instance, it'll affect their dorsal columns of their, um, um, of their um, spinal cord, and it makes them look like they're intoxicated. So you have a little bit of alcohol and you look like you're, you're very, very intoxicated. So the people are, um, are misread, they are not treated well. Um, there's, a lot of, um, uh, there's a lot of victim blaming um, about their diabetes because it's, it's felt to be related. And the reason I'm bringing this up is um, I'm up there with a group um, with Donna Murray who is at the University of Montreal. And what we're doing is a very, very um, comprehensive evaluation of the effects of mercury on the people in this community to come up with a different set of um, of signs and symptoms so that we can um, help the people um, be able to be accepted with the disability uh, review board in which right now they use the criteria from, um, from the Minimata study from Japan and they don't use 
criteria that are based on the exposures here. And so a lot of people who have profound neurological symptoms get denied disability because they don't meet those criteria. And so what we're doing is trying to change those criteria that reflect the situation in Grassy Narrow so more people can get disability because they can't work. And more importantly, we wanna help them build a center um, um, for, um, for physical therapy, occupational therapy, but also a palliative care center because they have a very, very, um, they have a, they, 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 they need a place to die and right now they can't die at home. So it's a very sad situation, but they have with the health of Judy, um, Judy uh, De Silva, the woman in the top corner, she's a nurse from there. And um, I asked if I asked her permission if I could speak about about what's happening in Grassy and Arrows. And she um, agreed for me to talk. And I said, what is it that I could tell um, doctors about what's going on in your community? And she said she would really want to talk about something like a passport or something in which you that when 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 they when a patient from grassy or somewhere else shows up to the hospital that that is part of their risk factor profile it's part of their um their diagnosis or the the way that a diagnosis is made it's not something that people just ignore because it is such a profound problem there and it's not understood we don't learn about it in medical school and um and and it's causing harm to these people um, it's particularly because they can't get monies to be able to take care of their, their children who have autism and all of the other neurological issues that are existing because of this. Please check um, the next uh, slide. So um, one of the things I saw in the um, UBC, um, in the Trek magazine, it said all of the big environmental battles have ever been involved were led by First Nations, and it's true. We are right there on the land. We're not going anywhere. We've been there from time immemorial. We have profound observational history um, and we know um, what has changed. And we have been speaking about changes for a very, very long time. The people of the Inuit from up north have been speaking about what's going on up there for such a long time. And we're now only now listening. And so sometimes Nobody listens unless we go and we put up a demonstration. And so some of the biggest demonstrations that you have seen over the past two decades, three decades, four decades are all about the environment, especially, I mean, when you're talking about indigenous people. Um, I wanted to highlight these four women, Jessica, Gordon, Sylvia, um, Sylvia, Nora Wilson, and Sheila McLean. Sylvia McAdams, that's it. And these women were the Idle No More, people who started Idle No More based on um, talking to each other, going on Facebook and sending the information out. A lot like what Ingrid Waldron is talking about. It doesn't take incredible degrees to uh, get on board and to start to make change. And these four women started an incredible human uh, movement among Indigenous people for um, um, knowledge seeking and um, capacity um, and getting the confidence to be able to speak out. And so these are the types of people that we don't often hear about, but really, really, we need to follow their examples. The next slide, please. This is the last slide. So, you know, as I said, I work in Akwazasne. I have um, a lot of patients. I have a lot of people who are in their 40s, 50s, 60s. These were the children who, before we knew that the environment was really, really sick, these are the children who, you know, put mud, met, like took the, the stuff from the GM plant and put it on themselves and pretended they were mud men. And, you know, these are the ones today who are coming in with, you know, you know, neurological symptoms. They've got diabetes. They've got really weird neuropathy and they're, and cancers and autoimmune diseases and the, 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 and the type of um, internal medicine that I see as a family doctor is profound. And, um, and I know that it's related to the historical exposures that I've described in my community. And I think as, as doctors, as medical students, like Ingrid said, we really, really need to start talking about this because diabetes is not just about what you eat and, um, and, um, and uh, how much activity you get. And, and uh, movement disorders are not just about alcohol. You know, these are not things that only we are responsible for, for harming ourselves. It's actually an environmental thing and it's based 
on history, it's based on the laws, it's based on the economic forces that, that, that help the, create this. And I'm hoping now that we're all having this discussion that in the future we'll be a lot better um, humans and we'll be able to look towards humanity and trying to help um, our earth so that we can all thrive um, in, um, for the future. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Horn. That was, yeah, just such a beautiful personal yet educational account of uh, some examples of environmental racism in Canada. And I know as a, as a medical student, I think it's insane that we aren't, aren't learning this in, in school because this directly ties to the health of the people that we're being trained to serve. So thank you so much. Um, I think we're gonna um, get to the questions now. Um, We'll start. I wanted, yeah, I just wanted to highlight um, a bit of what CAPE is doing, I guess, or, and what we can do now, because I think we've heard such kind of stirring and infuriating, I think, like I was almost shaking at some points listening, you know, to both speakers um, about what's happening in terms of environmental racism in Canada. And I think a lot of us want to think, you know, we you've told us what we can do, but we think like, how, how do we start, right? It's such a huge problem. And I just wanna highlight some of the things that CAPE is doing. So during each of the webinars, we want to highlight a facet of CAPE's work and how physicians and health professionals and, and others can get involved to make change. And so I think um, we've talked about Bill C2, uh, C230 and the environmental racism bill, but I think I also wanna discuss what Dr. Horn uh, mentioned um, in terms of CAPE's work on modernizing the CEPA. So in their September 2020 throne speech, the federal government committed to modernizing the CEPA, but without any clear timeline. And with the possible federal election coming in the next few months, there's a real risk that CEPA reform won't happen this election cycle. So since September, Dr. Anjali Helferty, our former toxics director and now interim executive director, has been spearheading CAPE's work on CEPA along with other environmental organizations by mobilizing members to meet with their MPs, um, letter writing campaigns and writing op-eds. And we're proud to announce actually that tomorrow on Monday, the government is finally introducing its bill to modernize CEPA. Um, so keep an eye out for communications from CAPE and our new toxics campaign coordinator, Dr. Jane MacArthur, about how to work with us to ensure that CEPA is strengthened and modernized in a way that protects everyone who lives in Canada fairly. And so we can we can move to the questions now. Thanks, Celia. Of course, thank you so much for highlighting that important reform. That is much overdue. Okay, we'll start off with the first question. This is for Dr. Waldron. As uh, from Angie, she says, hi, Dr. Waldron, thank you for your presentation. I was wondering if you could clarify the difference between a landfill and a dump. Is there more pollution and contamination of groundwater, et cetera, with one or the other? I don't think there's a difference. I think when, when Louise kind of jokingly said it's a dump, she was suggesting that the use of the term landfill was too polite. I could be wrong, I'm not an environmental scientist, but people use the terms interchangeably, waste sites, waste dump, landfill, and landfill is the more scientific term. And I think for Louise, that's just too polite. She said, it's a dump, <laughs> you know? So that's how I understood it. But somebody can correct me, somebody who's an environmental scientist could correct me if I'm wrong, I don't know. Okay, and there's a question here from Andrea Hall about sharing environmental racism teaching tools and packages. So maybe we can chat about that afterwards and see if there are things that we can share with the people who attended. Um, from Larry Barzilai, he says to Ingrid, I'm amazed that you would have to test water privately and that you couldn't ask a government authority to do this. Is this an ongoing problem? So in Nova Scotia, I'm not sure about the rest of Canada, um, homeowners are responsible for testing their own water. Uh, so, yes, so we, so at Rural Water Watch, we do this work at no cost. Um, I, I should say, however, that we were surprised that we actually received funding from Nova Scotia Environment, because of course, they're the source of many of the problems. But uh, the president of Rural Water Watch, Fred Bonner, who's a hydrogeologist, had, has a relationship with somebody there, because he used to work in Nova Scotia environment. And she liked the work that we were doing. 
and suggested that we put a proposal in for some funding. So they're actually quite happy to support us, to provide us with funding. But in Nova Scotia, I don't know about other parts of Canada, you are responsible for your own water testing. So for us, it, you know, this NGO is a community-based community initiative. So we have the community members on our board. We do everything, as I said, at no cost, and we enable community members to drive the work that we're doing. So they're on project committees as well. So they initiate the projects and we follow along. Uh, but it's all community and environmental scientists and the government is not involved. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Waldron. Um, the next question is, what is the name of the natural uh, or national association Dr. Waldron mentioned? I think you mentioned a few, but potentially you know what this is getting at. Uh, well, the National Anti-Environmental Racism Coalition is a new anti-environmental anti racism coalition I formed with Naolo Charles. So we haven't come up with a really good name for it as yet so we're still calling it the national anti-environmental racism coalition until we find a better name uh, so that is connected to make way make way is a charitable organization uh, so if you type in make way anti-environmental racism you'll find uh, a page where we're listed we are one of their platform projects and they have uh, several environmental initiatives, but they've put us under this category, this environmental racism category that's new for them. So happy to say that there's a focus at Makeway now on environmental racism, although they've always been involved in environmental issues. Now there's a clear focus on that topic. Thank you. I want to direct this question from Kaina Gata to Dr. Horn, um, because you do see patients in practice. And the question is, how has the pandemic interacted with his existing environmental racism? So one of the things that I didn't describe as much as I, I really wanted to was um, the impact of studies, the impact of research. Um, we always, um, we, we, we sometimes forget about the, the, the how, how scary research can be. And when people descended over and over into the community wearing hazmat suits and coming in and testing the breast milk and the blood and the urine and, and the soil and the water, you know, people became really, really afraid of the earth and they stopped doing everything. So um, there was like this complete reversal on engaging with the land. In fact, men stopped fishing and all of that cultural stuff just disappeared. All of that transmission of culture was gone within one generation. And so, um, and, and I feel the studies um, did a disservice. I really feel that um, that it, it caused harm. Maybe they had good intentions, but that the way that the stuff, the, the information was disseminated um, caused um, regular people to be afraid of the earth. Now, what happened with COVID is that we recognized that we're kind of on our own. And so we started all throughout the community, people started planting again people started really looking at the advisor, the fish advisor and going other places to fish. People started to re-engage with the land again that they hadn't done in a very long time. In on mass, it became a topic of discussion. So in fact, what COVID did was made us remember, which was, I think, probably one of the most beautiful things that, uh, that I could have imagined. This question is from Warren Bell. Uh, I'd like to ask both Dr. Waldron and Dr. Horn to comment on their observations about trends in awareness and action related to environmental racism and whether the speed of change is changing. Maybe we'll start with, uh, we'll start with Dr. Horn. I think the effects of environmental racism, the health effects, 
Um, we, 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 it's so mixed up um, in, um, in just the general way that um, healthcare is given. You know, you guys go through medical school and, um, and you're taught to become family doctors or doctors and, um, and, to, um, and to expect that there are certain things available, um, help that's available, different infrastructure that's available when you get out to practice. But if you go work in a native community, you're gonna find out that there's no infrastructure. There are, there's no college. Leagues. There's no other, you know, the nurses, um, you know, they're not the same type of nurses that you worked with when you went and, and got and did your residency. And so you go there and you're overwhelmed because you have all these tools that you just spent, you know, 15 years getting. And now they're not useful. They're use, they're not useful. And at the same time, you have all these people who are so ill and you have no frame of reference to be able to take care of them. And so they use their primary care in the emergency rooms and they show up and they're really, really sick. And the doctor is overwhelmed, tired. And rather than, and we're spending a lot of time talking about cultural competence and cultural safety and cultural awareness, but actually what happens is the doctor is really, really tired and it is overwhelmed with this person and can't help them. So what are they going to do? They're going to the racism comes out and they just, you know, um, blame the person. And so, um, and so what I'm saying is that it's, it, it can't be just, you know, race, environmental racism. It's so tied up with all these other things, this lack of infrastructure and this lack of primary care, um, this lack of an understanding of the nature of how um, a massive determinant of health is the environment. Like it's all mixed up. And so we, at the end of the day, just you know, really get on the bottom of this. Like we really, um, you know, um, are, are not doing well. When we talk about movement, I would say that it's 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 not moving very quickly at, at all. Um, I um, work with a bunch of uh, colleagues, indigenous physicians who work in our own communities across Canada. We've been meeting every week for a year now, and we talk about what's happening in our communities and how how um, primary care is 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 working out in the time of COVID. And I can tell you, racism is alive and well, and it just makes me so upset because um, how are we going to if we can't treat each other well, how are we going to learn how to love as a people, how to love the earth again and, and work towards um, trying to make her better? You know, um, if, if people don't care, how are we going to change? Um, and how are we gonna have people accept environmental policy if they don't believe in it? Just like the COVID vaccination, if they don't believe in it, how are you going to get them to accept to take it? How are we going to stop this problem where people who are not vaccinating because they're worried about this and this and that? You know, they just have there's so much, um, there's so much tied into, into that. And so what I'm saying is that if we have all of these environmental um, laws and all of this, 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 this environmental, I mean, um, this all this economic change that's going, political change that's going to happen, the people are not going to accept it if they don't believe it. And then they're going to push back harder and you're going to have more extreme uh, views and more racism. So like, I think that um, I'm very nervous because I kind of expected that what happened in my community where people started to get back to the land because they saw COVID, that's not necessarily happening in other places. And that's what really upsets me is that we should be doing land-based um, training and, and um, like, all over the place, not just in indigenous communities. We really need to get to, to start to become um, more aware of our environment. You know, Melissa, you did this um, environmental um, um, prescription, you know, go outside. You know, we have to go outside more. We have to fall in love with the earth again so that we can start to accept all the changes that are going to happen, whether we like it or not. And, um, and if more if a more core of us accept it, then maybe, maybe it will be easier. But I'm really worried that this transition is not going to be easy. So no, I don't think it's happening fast. I think we have to put more energy into our children, like what you're doing, Ingrid, with one of your programs and the children. It's so important because they talk to their families. If we can get them outside with their families and start, you know, growing and start to enjoy the earth again and participate with her, you know, instead of going on a jet ski, get like a kayak, you know, like <laughs> just all this, it goes, it's so huge. And so, no, I don't think it's fast enough, unfortunately. Dr. Horn, do you, or uh, Dr. Waldron, do you think you could comment on that, on the pace of change? 
I mean, it's changing, but yes, it's very slow. I think I was really naive when I came on board this topic in 2012. I thought, just get a bill and everything's going to happen really quickly. And now I look back at the environmental activist that I know and the one who actually handed this project to me and I realized how tough it is. I remember, I remember him saying to me, oh, I don't think anything is going to happen, but here's the project, <laughs> do, do it. And I thought, boy, isn't he cynical, you know? But now I look back and I'm like, I understood what, what he meant. Um, there are changes though, I'm seeing it. Uh, for example, I would say in the past year, and, and I, I could give CAPE as an example, I have been asked to speak at events that are only about environmental racism. Like that wasn't happening before. I would be asked to speak at events on health, climate change, social justice, racism, but they would ask me to speak about environmental racism. And now I'm seeing, you know, people are reaching out to me saying, we're planning an event on environmental racism. Another topic that used to invite me, you know, was sustainability, right? Which, which I have problems with that term. But now it's environmental racism specifically, like CAPE. I don't know if CAPE has ever had a talk on environmental. So I'm seeing that change that people are much more aware of the term and very interested in the topic. I've seen that over the past year. I feel like, unfortunately, not that it's not important, climate change is very important. I know it's the issue of the day, but I find that sometimes climate change discussions obscure the issue of environmental racism or it's used interchangeably. So people will ask me to speak at a climate change event and I assume they wanna hear about environmental racism then they start throwing out questions about climate change. You know, so it's almost like environmental racism is some type of add-on. However, with the individuals who are focused on climate justice, I feel that those individuals are much more interested in hearing about environmental racism. So I feel like there are a lot of talks happening now and a focus on climate justice and how it disproportionately impacts certain communities. And it's much easier then to kind of bring along the topic of environmental racism because it's also about disproportionality. So in terms of just public engagement events and, and interest what I'm seeing from community members, activists, scholars, there's an interest in this topic. And I think in order for things to change, people have to become aware of it. They have to be interested in it. They have to sit like people are right now listening to it. And as I said earlier, empathizing, understanding, having the right analysis, and then they might act. So more of this is happening and it's being named as environmental racism. Uh, I think the bill shows progress. The fact that it got approved a second reading is slight progress. And, uh, but once again, slow. And what makes this topic very difficult? It's about capital. It's about profit for government. That's why it's tough. That's why it's slow going. So as long as we have those competing interests, you know, the health of individuals, which is actually not a priority, for individuals who believe that this is not a health issue and then profit, like which one will win out? So I, I get it, I understand why it's so tough, but I think we need to keep pushing. And I think that young people are starting to get on board, particularly I wanna, I wanna target those young people who are so excited about climate change because the young people are, are so passionate about climate change. So often I say to them, I wish you could also be excited about environmental racism. These are connecting issues. And then I show them how they're connecting issues. But the young people today in Canada, in Nova Scotia, passionate about climate change. But I want you to kind of make an intellectual leap. Environmental racism, the pollutants, you know, that are emitted, they have implications for climate change. So we need a holistic understanding of this. And if we can bring the young people on board who are so passionate about climate change to become also passionate about polluting industries, then I think we have a burgeoning movement where people have an analysis that's much more holistic and not separating all of these different issues, health, separating health from climate change and separating justice from climate change and environmental justice from environmental racism. It's all connecting. Agreed. And thank you so much for making those connections. I, I, you know, I think we all wish we could talk to you for another hour, an hour and a half, but I think we have to tie up to respect your time. I'm just putting some links in the chat there. Um, 
And so if you want to stay involved in our advocacy efforts with CAPE around SEPA and other major environmental issues facing Canadians today, if you haven't already, um, please check out our Toxics campaign page or join CAPE at uh, the links I put in the chat. And if you like today's webinar, we'd encourage you to make a donation to Cape BC so we can keep inspiring action on environmental issues that matter. And I'm going to turn it over to Celia to say a few words about CFMS Heart. Yeah, just a few few words. Uh, if you're not already part of the CFMS Heart Network and you're a medical student and you want to be engaged in issues like these, um, the first uh, Google Doc is to sign up for the network. You'll get all the emails and newsletters associated with Heart and all the opportunities to get involved. And if you want to learn a little bit more about Heart or have any kind of med student collaboration and something that you have going on, uh, feel free to email us as well. And Celia, did you just want to mention our next, our yeah. next webinar? Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Melissa. Um, so yeah, our next webinar we're excited to announce is uh, May 2nd, and it's called Whistleblowing, Putting Health First. So uh, here, if you, if you do come, you will hear from the inaugural winner, Ryerson University's Whistleblower Award about his advocacy efforts against the oil sands and environmental scientist about her fight against frac the fracking establishment. Uh, this is Dr. John O'Connor and Karen Hosford um, and Anjali uh, Helferty as well. And so stay tuned for uh, information on this. Um, it'll, be, it'll be coming your way soon. Thank you so much to everyone who was involved, Dr. Waldron, Dr. Horn, Celia, um, Kevin Liang, who's actually giving, providing tech support behind the scenes in that black square there. Um, we appreciate your time so much and all the efforts you're giving towards advancing justice in so many different ways um, across this country. So thank you and have a great rest of your Sunday, everyone. Thank you. Thanks a lot for inviting us. Bye, Dr. Horn. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you so much.